you know, every day I go on Zillow and I look at houses and every day I find four to 10 houses that are fully furnished and they want, because sometimes there's a way in Zillow that you can remove certain features. And I saw one house that was going for $8,000 and the Zillow rent for this house was 2,500. I think there's a way to move that because I don't see it in all these ads. But you have a lot of people who were smart enough to get a mortgage, to get an investment property, and they've put it out there in the marketplace for these exaggerated rents. This is something I've been tracking for months, months and months. I've literally seen a regular house, not a bad house, but a regular house for 8,000. And I've seen another regular house that was fully furnished. They wanted $15,000 per month. And I'm just sitting there like, you know, let me, let me go ahead and share some stuff with you. Like one of the things that I do is I look at stuff from a certain vantage point. Um, I was in the real estate market and I was looking at this $3 million condo and I put in the offer on it, but it became a bidding war. And if you know anything about condos, condos do not appreciate like regular houses. So there was a chance that I could have got into this condo and paid more money for it than I would have been able to get out of it. And I'm talking about selling it 10, 15, 20 years down the road. So I, I like backed out. And I've been looking at, you know, more than likely I'm gonna get another house. And I've been looking at real estate and with my Zillow searches, the strangest things come up. I will see houses at one point, the houses in the hood were a price at the same price points as houses in Sandy Springs. And if you don't know anything about Georgia, Sandy Springs is a high net worth neighborhood, very high. It's one of the highest net worth neighborhoods in the Southeast. And I'm just sitting there like, what is up with all of these people who were smart enough to get a mortgage, but have no clue to how the marketplace works? Because one of the things about Zillow, and Zillow will tell on you, Zillow, like there's this one house that I have seen that has come off Zillow one, two, three times. The house has been on the market for nine months. But what they'll do is they'll take the Zillow listing down and they'll put up a brand new listing to make it seem more special than it really is. And I saw a house that was for rent for 165 days. Now they weren't asking something unusual. It just shows you that the real estate markets are slowing down. This just shows you that. And, you know, I asked myself this question. Why are there so many people who fail at business? Because, you you know, I often have people who put the statistics in that X amount of people fail at business because of this and this and this. And I have I had an epiphany today. Like my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel made money when it wasn't monetized by YouTube because I started it with a business mindset. And this is one of the reasons that I think that so many people fail in business. They don't have a business mindset. They have a hope and pray mindset. Now, why do I say that? I say that because the number of people who were smart enough to get themselves a piece of real estate were not smart enough to know how to optimize um, the real estate. Uh, I, I have a friend, she has 25 houses and we were having lunch the other day and we were just talking. 
and it was, it was a hilarious lunch because um, my friend, she doesn't buy houses in good condition. If the house isn't trashed or needs some kind of work, she's not interested because she learned, because her first three properties, she owned outright because of her strategy. And she's like, she, she was just like, the people that I see in real estate today, it just cracks me up because she says, the deals that people have been bringing to her, because a lot of people know that she's in real estate, she says they're completely unworkable. The numbers just don't make sense. And she's like, I'm glad I got in real estate in the good old days because right now it's, it's kind of nuts. And one of the things that I see is that people will jump into something with this hope and pray strategy. I hope it works out. Let's try this. Let's. There is no actual business mindset in the equation whatsoever. Because one of the things I can say right now, there are multiple people who are selling um, Turo automation courses. And Turo is, Turo is crashing, Turo is crashing. A lot of Turo hosts are getting out the business because it is crashing. There's a lot of people who are selling Airbnb services, how to do Airbnb. Airbnb is crashing and this is not really hard to find if you just do a little research, just do a little research. But these people are still, right now, there's someone that's gonna sign up and they're gonna put their car on Turo today. Someone's gonna do that. And there was a guy, his YouTube channel is The Financial Wolf. He's a really young kid. I think he started his YouTube channel when he was actually a teenager in high school. And he bought not one, but two cars for Turo. He got into a partnership with these guys who had 40 cars on Turo. And, you know, to his credit, once again, Financial Wolf, to his credit, he's been very honest about his Toro business and he's, he's out of Toro. <laughs> he literally have sold the two cars that he had for Toro, sold them, got his money back and he's out of that business because based upon his analysis, and he has a lot of videos, you can go to the Financial Wolf. He's a young kid, I mean, very young. I think he's 20 years old now, maybe 20, 21. And he just goes through all the things he did how he bought the car, how he had repair issues and all this other stuff. And he just wasn't really making a lot of money. Now, one of the things is he's a YouTuber. <laughs> and I would say his YouTube channel makes 10, 15,000 a month. So that, 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 that's where he got the money to get into Toro. And this is one of the things he's seeing. He's like, I come up here and I make these how to do videos. You know, once again, I think the guy is, pretty honest and straightforward. And he gives you an accurate portrayal of how things works. So shout out to the financial wolf. Um, but he's getting out the Toro business. He's getting out. And literally I have seen host after host, you know, and it's usually these smaller, newer channels where there, there was this other guy who was like talking about Toro and how he, would go on the Toro map and he knew, he knew that certain Toro hosts were no longer on Toro because it's like, I used to, this guy, he's gone, he's gone, he's gone. So there is abundant evidence in the marketplace that renting cars is a sketchy business. Doing Toro in the wrong place is a sketchy business buying a house and renting it out once again uh, with my friend we were having this conversation she's like and this is one of the things she says that she met a guy who had paid forty thousand dollars for real estate training and then they went to dinner and she just kind of laid out her plan she said the numbers always have to make sense to me and when she explained her 
plan. The guy said, I have learned more from you in an hour long dinner than I had after spending 40,000. Because here's the thing, on YouTube, um, one of the things is people go for the bigger personalities, which usually are not the best personalities for learning business. And, you know, like the Burr strategy in real estate with the interest rates and the price of housing, I don't think the Burr strategy is going to work in the current real estate market, not with traditional banks, not with these interest loans. So having my dinner with my friend and we we're just talking, I, you know, and I was like, how many real estate investors do you think are successful? And she kind of leaned back and she was said, I would say that 90 something percent of the people who get into real estate never turn it into a full time occupation. She's like, you know, because essentially she had a high income job. She got her first three properties. She paid cash. She fixed them up because she had a high income job. And then she got some loans because this this is one of the things because she had a high income job and she had not one, not two, but three properties that paid off. She was able to add that rental income into her loan application. So, I mean, she was going to the bank making five hundred thousand dollars, you know, so they were just like, hey, here, here, here's the money. Here's the money. But she had a solid business plan. She had a solid you know, and at the moment, you know, she's like, she's out looking, but she says, I am not going to pull the trigger unless the numbers make sense. And she's like, in this market, a lot of numbers just don't make sense to be a buy and hold landlord. You know, she says, I got to find something that's halfway burnt down to make my numbers work. And then she also brought up another issue the issue of getting good contractors. That's something that she said she has struggled with for years. Cause she's like, she would get a good contractor on one project and then she'll try to get him again and she can't find him. She's like that, that has been one of her biggest issues was finding reliable contractors. So this is the number one reason that I think so many people fail to be successful in business. There is no business mindset. There's no business plan. There's no, there's no analyticals. There's no looking at numbers. They saw someone on YouTube or they saw someone on TikTok or they saw someone on Instagram do it. And then they feel that they'll just do this. And there, there was one couple who got into the Airbnb space and they put out a video months ago that they were gonna create their own advertising because here's the pathway. If you're on Airbnb and you've been renting during the stimulus period, when the PPP money was out, all this money was out, you were out here. Now we're dealing with the real economy with no stimulus money. No stimulus money at all. And now things are very, very different. Um, I've known a, a bunch of people have reached out to me, you know, well, they had reached out to me when I was putting up the Kill Switch Chronicles talking about my situation. I literally was in the car rental business six months before I realized that this business absolutely, for me, it sucked. For me, it sucked. And I had a large enough fleet at 31 cars. And the majority of people on YouTube do not have that many cars. They have half, they may have 20. They don't have 31. So I was able to get wisdom and insights from having, to me, that wasn't a large fleet. To me, a large fleet would be 100 cars, 200 cars. But I was able to get some data points that a lot of people just couldn't get because they didn't have the scale. 
And fortunately for me, I paid cash for those cards. I did not have loans, I did not use business credit. And because I approached it from a very pragmatic standpoint, and I approached it from a security standpoint, because I wasn't using credit, I didn't have to worry about like when, when the business turned south, you know, I was kind of worried because supposedly you can only sell so many cars. That's not true. If you actually had a car titled in your name, if you had a hundred cars titled in your name and you wanted to put them on sale, you could sell all of them, not run into any jurisdiction issues with the state. But if you were going out and buying cars and you never titled the car in your name, you can run into some problems. So I was able to sell 28 of those bad boys. And I'm so glad I got rid of the majority of them last year because the prices are crashing. The prices are crashing. And, you know, I am much better from a mental health standpoint today than I was, um, you know, back in the day. Um, because, you know, I looked at it from a very pragmatic business standpoint and I looked at the numbers and stuff and I just realized that the business was for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say for myself, for me, it was extremely expensive. Car insurance was like 30,000 a year. Car repairs were 160,000 because people kept tearing up my cars, kept running over stuff. And th this is the thing that just still gets me. When you picked up the car, all of the tires were fine. But for some reason, you have the car for a few days and you have a flat. It is now my responsibility to get that flat tire fixed when you ran over something. And it became a really contentious thing because I was like, look, when you picked up that car, were the tires flat? No, the tires went flat after you had it in your position. And if I have to fix that tire, I'll just come get my car. I am not going to fix that tire. I mean, it got that, and it, it got really angry. And I had some people who were just like, all right, Ryan, I'll fix it. And I had some people, well, you need to come get your car. And, you know, just numbers and looking at the ability of a business to stand on its own. It's just, I feel that that deep analytical status is just missing from so many business people, people who are, I, let me go ahead and correct. These people are not business people. That, that's part of the problem. That's part of the problem. Um, you know, there were some other businesses that I looked at getting into and I did a thorough due diligence. I paid consultants, I worked on the businesses and there's some businesses that I, I probably won't even talk about that I looked at and I just, once I ran the numbers, really, really ran the numbers hard, I was like, oh, this business is just stinky. This is a stinky little business. And uh, like, I'll share the moving company. Man, I am so glad I did not get into the moving company business. Now, I did have someone like, you know, someone in Kentucky has um, put out you know, uh, he hired some college guys. They all have their moving companies. And he's like, they're all doing well and stuff. And I'm just like, I would thoroughly disagree with that because let me, let me, let me explain some stuff to you. I live in a very expensive business building in Buckhead, Georgia. The number of people who have moved out of this business, this building has been crazy. Because um, literally, you know how I can know they moved out? The parking situation. When I first moved in here, parking was stupid. Um, the guest parking was always full, always. I would have people come over and visit and they would like, I would have to go in and let them up into the resident parking because there wasn't enough guest parking. And I have literally, rolled in here at 12 o'clock at night and there was three and four and five empty spots and guest parking on a weekend. That lets me know a lot of people have moved out of this building. A lot of people have moved out of this building. 
And what we're seeing, because, um, you know, I think we're going to have a recession at the end of this year or the beginning of 2024. Just looking at the economic numbers, just looking at the numbers and stuff. And I, like I said, I am really, really glad that I did not do a car rental too by getting in another business where I was just going to have to come out of pocket with a lot of money. And I, I'll be honest, I actually looked at getting into the trucking business until I did my research. And this was like last year. I did my research because, you know, I was going to go ahead and get three trucks, get a warehouse and get some people and stuff. And I just looked at it and I looked at it and I looked at it and I ran the numbers and I was like, this would be the car rental business times two. And I, you know, once again, we in life, we all make mistakes. You know, we all do things that are wrong. We all um, hit the, the bar from a wrong position. But this would be, that would have been the first time that I've ever done something like what I would call back to back stupidity. And I, I once again, I did my research and it, just the numbers, the numbers, because you know, you would hear people on YouTube, we're making 5,000 a month, $5,000 a week. Okay, that's your gross revenue. What is your actual net revenue? And there was a guy and um, I, I can't remember his YouTube channel, but he's in the, the uh, Toro business and he gave, you know, shout out to this guy. He gave an honest and accurate portrayal of his overhead. He included all of his car payments. He included his rent. He included all of his expenses, which, you know, came up to be quite significant. So shout out to this guy. And that's one of the things I ran through because I ran through some numbers and then the whole thing with getting truckers and the, it, it just like, it, it just seemed to be nightmare number two for me. And I was just sitting there, oh, we're not gonna do that. And then with the credit business and some other stuff, and there were some other businesses I was looking at and I just decided to chill, to use my business mindset, to use my analytical skills, which I tried to do with the car rental business, but there was so much false information out there that only once I got into it, once I bought the cars, because buying the cars wasn't the problem. Renting out the cars wasn't the problem. The problem was the renters. And this was something that I could not put into paper until I actually started renting. The renters were trash. Uh, right now, uh, a lot of people's court cases are coming up and they're going to trial. I got a call from one person's attorney talking about would I take restitution, meaning that now that they can pay me. And I did not call this attorney back. I, I have not called any of them back because I don't really care what happens to these people because I called, I begged, that's like, just bring the car back. Just, and they refused to bring the cars back. The only way that I got my cars back was to file a police report and have these people arrested because they simply would not bring my cars back. They just wouldn't do it because they didn't think nothing was going to happen to them until they're driving. Whoop. Hey, we got to report this car stolen. Are you uh, Glendon Cameron? You're not, you're under arrest. They got booked, they got fingerprinted, they got a mug shot, and now they've got to go to court. And you know, a lot of them are kind of reaching out to me. It's like, hey man, can we work something out? And uh, one of the renters called me and I don't know how he got my number. I, I, I have no clue that I got my number because I didn't put it out. And it's like, yeah, I rented this and I got arrested. I'm just trying to work something out. And I was like, you remember me calling you and begging you to bring my fucking car back? You remember that? And you just ignored me? He said, well, yeah. And I hung up on him and I blocked his number. I don't care if these people go to jail. I don't care if they suffer. I, I just don't care because I literally called each and every one of them just to bring the car back, just bring the car. And they wouldn't do it. And that renter behavior was something that I could not get firm analysis on because people weren't talking about that. They weren't talking about how bad these renters were. 
and I'll say it, uh, the majority, I will not say the majority, I would say 40% of the renters on hire car were trash. I will say that. And they would get your car, and once again, the two day rentals were the worst. They get the two hour for two days rental, instantly be late. These were gonna be, I had someone that I had to go pick up a car, and she's like, I was only two days late. As if being two days late was not a problem. Once again, once you start to bring business analysis to the table, things change dramatically. Things change drastically. And I begin to develop a greater understanding of what I was dealing with, what I was facing, once I actually had the data on the renters. And once again, I don't care who sees this video, 40%, 45% of the renters on our car were trash, just trash. And I mean, and then we, we, you know, at one point out of the 31 cars, I had 12 wreck cars, 12, 35% wreck rate. And if I had continued on, it would have been higher. And there were certain cars I protected. I refused to lower the price. And that pricing issue is one of the reasons that I was able to sell these cars for close to what I paid for them because, um, man, 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 man. But, you know, the lack of a business mindset and the lack of a rigorous business application is one of the reasons that most people fail in business because I look at when I failed in business and I have to go back many, many years when I was in the military and I just didn't have any experience. I didn't know how to sell. I didn't know how to brand. I didn't know, I didn't know how to put nothing together. I knew nothing. And this was one of the reasons that I consistently failed. And then my first successful business was doing something that I knew how to do. And this is one of the biggest reasons that so many businesses fail is people will get into a business like these real estate investors, like these people who are doing Airbnb, like these people who are getting in Toro, like these people who are running the Etsy without a sound business mind. It's just completely absent, just completely gone. And that's one of the reasons I think so many, because, you know, um, until the car rental business, and honestly, if I wanted to deal with the headaches and I wanted to throw a little bit more money into it, I could have been making money, but I would have a business that literally I had, I don't have my cell phone on me, but I had another little phone. I grew to hate that phone because every time it rung, it was something wrong. It was, it was just literally, I, I grew to hate that phone. So I could have a car rental business and I could be, and that was another thing. Another, another, another big thing. And this kind of goes back to my friend who does real estate. The cost of acquisition of the products for renting cars. It, it was just, you have to put so much money out. Then you have to pay insurance, then you have to have repairs and all this other stuff. And then the money compared to the cost of buying the car, unless you get a cheap car, it just trickles in. I mean, you know, you could do 800 to maybe 1500, you know, depending on what kind of car it is per month. And if you got a $30,000 car and let's say you're, you're making 1500, that that's 18,000 a year. It's going to take you two years, two years to recoup the cost of the car. And at that point, and this is something that uh, I heard Lucky Lopez talk about. A lot of people bought these cars. Now that the market has crashed, they cannot get out these cars because they owe more on the car than the car is actually worth. So that, that was another, another issue that faces people who are not getting into business without an appropriate business mindset. Like I said, my friend in real estate, like, I mean, she had me rolling. 
just talking about all these people who think they're real estate investors. They got them one one rental house. And she said, she's her, her favorite. She said, those little deers, they got their one rental property and they think they're gonna be a real estate mogul. She said, they just cracked me. I'm like, cause see, this is one of the things. You hear a lot of people on YouTube who talk about real estate in terms to get you to get in to buy their product. If my friend, and I've tried to get her to do a YouTube channel, cause I think, cause she's funny. It would be hilarious. She said, those poor little deers, they got their one little rental and they think they're gonna be a real estate mogul. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> the, the thing is, and I'm gonna say this, the, the people who are really in real estate, who are really making money, who've set up a good thing, they think that the noobs are hilarious. I will say that. And you will not see that on YouTube. You will not see that on YouTube because everyone on YouTube is trying to get you to buy in. They're not trying to tell you the truth. And she's like, she's like, she's got a few real estate friends and they get together and they talk business and stuff. And they think that the noobs are hilarious. She's like, they, she, they like, once again, you will not see this on YouTube. So yeah, that's one of the things that's going on. That's, that's one of the big things that's going on. All right. So it's June and we're diving into the YouTube stuff. Tomorrow is a heavy day. I'm going to be creating a lot of content, a lot of stuff for my YouTube course tomorrow. So this is why you want to get in because right now there's about 20 hours of training, the money course, the productivity course, the corporate citizen course, now the YouTube course. So I know that many of you are just kind of waiting because, um, I had an amazing day before the price went up. I mean, I made more money in one day than most of y'all make in a year. So I know that people are just kind of waiting and waiting that, 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 but don't wait because with the YouTube training, there's a lot of stuff you got to do. There's a lot of things you have to do the way that I'm going to teach you. And I'm going to teach you the multiple ways to make YouTube money. There will be a section on there about making YouTube money with AdSense. Uh, that can be a thing if you're willing to do the work. So go below, get in. The link's going to be below for you guys to get in and for you guys to start learning. Because like the YouTube thing, I think it's going to be, um, I don't think I'm going to start the next course in June uh, because the YouTube, it's got to be, it's going to be a lot. There's a lot of things you need to know, a lot of things you need to discuss, a lot of things you need to understand. But if you're willing to do the work, you can make a ton of money with YouTube. And this is not something that is a theory. I've been making six to seven figures per year from YouTube since 2000. Well, we're not going to count 2009. We're not going to count 2010, but we're going to go 2011 to today. I've been making six to seven figures per year from YouTube and once again, if you're willing to do the work, if you're willing to put in a sweat and sweat and do the stuff, you can get yourself positioned very well with YouTube. And there's going to be a lot of different training in the YouTube course. So you can get it. The link's going to be below. Just go ahead and get in the links. And my name is Glendon Cameron, and I will see you guys in the next one.